an ECG monitor displaying a steady heartbeat, clinically white ceilings with harsh fluorescent lights, and the ECG slowing to a flat line. Hiraku Machio remembers these images flashing in his dreams as he opens his eyes to a bright new morning. Upon venturing outside to go about his day, the village chief is greeted by his demi-human villagers. Never in Hiraku's wildest dreams did he dare to believe he'll someday have a cozy life like this. And to understand just how lucky Hiraku is, we need to go back to the beginning. Somewhere in the cosmos, the god governing the world speaks to Hiraku. He lived for 39 years with great hardships, betrayed by others and eventually dying from a terminal illness. To atone for a mistake that gave Hiraku this cruel life, the god will give Hiraku another chance, with a healthy body free of illnesses. On top of that, the god lets Hiraku request anything to help him live his new life how he sees fit. Out of everything Hiraku could ask for, his request is a peaceful farming life far from civilization. Seeing a farming show on TV while trapped in bed in the hospital made Hiraku long for this simple life. After contacting the god of farming, the god informs Hiraku will also receive the omnipotent farming tool power. But that, the god bids Hiraku farewell, sending him to his second life. Hiraku awakes, lying on the forest floor in the middle of nowhere. Not only can he move his body, Hiraku's also years younger than when he died in the first life. Giving his young body a good stretch, Hiraku looks forward to living this new life to the fullest as a farmer. Looking around, all Hiraku sees are trees. Well, he did ask for a place far from civilization. Thinking of what he can do for now, Hiraku tries out the omnipotent farming tool, and a hoe magically appears in his hand. He keeps swinging but never gets tired. As Hiraku assesses the soil, he remembers he'll need to secure water and food before planting anything. Exploring the area, Hiraku listens for a river, but all he hears are leaves. He then spots a unique looking tree in the distance. It's a huge tree up close, making it a perfect landmark for Hiraku's base. After wandering around the area, Hiraku can't find any river or pond nearby, so to find some water, Hiraku tries dowsing, a method for finding hidden underground objects using the movement of a stick or pendulum. But Hiraku doesn't get it and decides to dig forever until he finds water. Unfortunately, Hiraku can create complicated machines, so he'll have to make do with a shovel for this job. Much like in Minecraft, Hiraku realizes he can't just dig straight down. By excavating diagonally, Hiraku can easily return to the surface. He digs and digs until finally, Hiraku finds water. Next is food, but Hiraku doesn't feel hungry yet, so he continues to build a good base. Along the path stands a sturdy tree. Hiraku figures he'll need to make a cut on either side, but with just one slash, Hiraku slices the tree neatly with his axe. With that done, Hiraku gets to work. Hiraku drags the log using a tool he doesn't know the name of. As long as he can picture it, the farming tool can transform into it. The sun begins to set as Hiraku stares at the lumber. If this was Minecraft, he should have a hut built by now. But making one isn't as easy as Hiraku thought. Realizing it's almost nighttime, Hiraku tries to conjure a source of light. A flashlight, lamp, lighter, match, anything. But perhaps the farming tool can't produce something that can be depleted. With that, Hiraku conjures a magnifying glass, though he'll need to wait for the sun to reappear to use it. As night falls, Hiraku hastily digs a hole in the trunk as temporary shelter. He uses the time to process wood through trial and error. Hiraku thought he'd be a goner when it got dark, but surprisingly, he could see well at night. It's either because of the healthy body the god gave him or the two moons above. Yup, he's definitely in another world. The sun shines on a new day, and after drinking water from the well, Hiraku starts a fire. He continues clearing the area for the field. As Hiraku's energy begins to deplete with all the work, he figures he'll need to look for food. Thankfully, Hiraku doesn't need to look further. A monstrous bunny charges at him. Now he has some rabbit meatballs to munch on. It doesn't taste the best, but hey, it's edible. Whatever comes in will come out later. And for that purpose, Hiraku crafts a toilet complete with a drainage system. But defecating while exposed is difficult, so Hiraku sets up wooden blinds for privacy. With empty bowels, Hiraku is fired up to plow the field, thinking of what he can grow all the while. Despite his enthusiasm as the sun sets, Hiraku faces the reality that he still needs to scour the forest for seeds to plant. But to his incredible surprise, sprouts are growing the next morning in every row of the fields. It's not called omnipotent farming tool for nothing. Hiraku may not know what he's growing, but he'll protect these fields no matter what. 
The day is still young, so Hiroku works on placing fences and digging up a trench around the area. It takes him a few days to complete while taking down rabbits that try to attack him. Hiroku wonders why they're targeting him, but at least he has a steady food source while waiting for the crops. Each day, the sprouts in Hiroku's field grow bigger, especially since he has been watering them. Another few days later, Hiroku finally built himself a hut after much struggle. One day, Hiroku spots a pair of big dogs outside the fence. Seeing how injured they are, Hiroku invites them inside. Thankfully, Hiroku has lots of leftover meat from a boar he took down as he watches the dog eat their fill. Not a moment too soon, the female dog begins whimpering. <sighs> She's going to give birth! Hiroku quickly takes them to the log cabin. After thinking of how he can help with the delivery, Hiroku settles on lighting a bonfire outside the cabin. He retreats to his trunk shelter as sleep slowly takes over him. The next morning, Hiroku is delighted to find four healthy puppies in the house. Aww, they're so cute! Hiroku cut the best part of the boar for the dogs to celebrate the delivery. Seeing the dogs perfectly settled in the hut, Hiroku decides to build an improved cabin as his home. Soon, Hiroku's crop are ready for harvest. The tomatoes may be small, but they're juicy. As he continues to care for the crops, the dogs, Kuro, the dad, and Yuki, the mom, hunt for game and patrol the surroundings. While the puppies, Kuroichi, Kuroni, Kurosan, and Kuroyong, do cute puppy things. Surprisingly, the dogs like eating vegetables and seeing them happily munching on tomatoes motivates Hiraku to do his best, slowly and peacefully. From a lofty abode, the god checks in on Hiraku. He mistakenly allowed the innocent man to live a life fit for a sinner. To atone for this, the god gave Hiraku a second life. However, the god has made yet another mistake by sending Hiraku to a forest in a dangerous area filled with nasty monsters. It's literally called the Forest of Death, but there's nothing to be done now since the god can't interfere with the soul's life once it has started. All he can hope for is that if Hiraku finds his way back to him, he'll be able to forgive him. Meanwhile, Hiraku's learning more about the omnipotent farming tool as days go by, like how imagining the plants Hiroko wants to grow while using the farming tool will sow those seeds in the ground. Hiroko has also noticed crops planted with the farming tool grow very quickly, so he'll need to look out for them to prevent damage, like with potatoes turning green. To thank the gods who bestowed him with this life, Hiroko decides to make some statues of them. Things are slowly becoming civilized, though Hiroko's cooking still needs work. All he can do is boil rabbit meat and farm fresh vegetables since he doesn't have anything to season them. After eating his fill, Hiroko decides to plant some fruit-bearing trees. They usually take years to bear fruit, so Hiraku will need patience. In the meantime, spending time with the dogs, which surprisingly have horns, is a good way for Hiraku to pass the time. The dogs are also really useful for navigating the forest. Thanks to them, Hiraku found a river 30 minutes away from his base. By digging out a path, Hiraku can run water to his home. He then thinks of conjuring a wheelbarrow to speed up the construction, but Hiraku will need to fix the roads first. Back home, Hiraku expands his fields to grow crops like grapeseed for oil, wheat for flour, and sugarcane for sugar. If only he can grow salt too. The days pass, and soon, the weather begins turning cold. To prepare for winter, Hiroku uses the pelt from giant rabbits, but it smells awful. His only option is to stay inside and gather firewood and food. As Hiroku does this, Kuro alerts him of a visitor. It's a giant spider who can make really nice cloth. And she looks so cute too. Hiroku decides to name the spider Zabotong and let her live up in the huge tree, munching on potatoes. On top of weaving fabric, Zabuton can make clothes really well. Now Hiroku has proper winter clothing, bedding, and curtains. Winter finally arrived, and thanks to his preparations, Hiroku and the dogs are living inside comfortably. As he munches on tasteless potatoes, Hiroku wonders how long it's been since he talked to someone. At this rate, he might forget how to speak. The cold season eases up, and soon, spring arrives. Hiroku watches with joy and sadness as the puppies all grow grown up, enter the forest. And not a moment too soon, they're all back with their partners. Another surprise awaits Hiraku as Zapoton shows up with a bunch of kids. Everyone has a bigger family now. Since there are more mouths to feed, Hiraku needs to work even harder. While plowing the fields, Hiraku hears Zapoton's alarm. Kuro leads him into the middle of the forest, where Hiraku finds a barely clothed girl. She looks distressed as the dogs and Zapoton surround her. Hiraku tries to stop them as he approaches the girl calling for help, but as he bends down to give her his vest, Hiroko gets bit 
written on the net. The girl's a vampire. Specifically, a vampire who needs to eat to grow and make her clothes. Unfortunately for her, biting Hiragu is a big mistake. The dogs immediately attack her, causing her to revert to her smaller, unclothed form. Though the girl admits she attacked the dogs first, Hiraku feels bad about how hurt she got, so Hiraku offers his blood to help her recover. Thanks to the god's blessing, Hiraku's healthy body can withstand this. After she's done, Hiraku notices she's smaller than her form earlier. He offers more of his blood so she can transform into her full form. Out of concern, of course, and not because Hiraku wants to see her more mature physique. Seeing Hiraku's base delights the girl, as all the unknown plants interest her. Conjuring a pair of scissors, Hiraku cuts a tomato for the girl to try. She enjoys it greatly, and hearing her praises makes Hiraku happy. With the girl wanting to see more, they spend the rest of the day tending to the crops. As night falls, they retreat to the cabin, where the girl delightedly logs everything she has learned. Hiraku learns her name is Lulu Lucy, and she researches medicinal plants. Because some nobles were trying to steal her research, she ran away, searching for a place to lay low. Then she heard of this forest and decided that going here would help further her research. Lu tells Hiraku all this, and she learns that he has no idea about the forest's savage reputation. Yet, he tames many monsters. Just as Lu asks if she can visit again, Hiraku asks her to stay with him forever. Though Hiraku doesn't mean it romantically initially, he doubles down and asks Lu to be his lifetime companion. Lu accepts, and Hiraku jumps to hug her in his excitement. The next morning, Lu chooses to remain in her younger form so Hiraku can control himself better. With that, Lu has become Hiraku's first demi-human villager. Thanks to Lu, Hiraku's problems with lights and salt have been fixed. Lu uses simple magic to provide light in various places in the village. And as for salt, Lu points out a salt strip underneath the earth that Hiraku failed to notice. So, basically, you've been eating bland this entire time and then all of a sudden, bam, there's salt right beneath you this entire time. Today, they're drinking the herbal tea Lu brewed. They only enjoy the quiet time in the orchard for a short time as Zabuton raises the alarm. Rushing into the forest leads them to a familiar situation. Instead of a vampire, an angel is cornered by the dogs. Hiraku frees her, but she notices Lu trying to leave the scene. The angel orders the vampire to stop, which signals the dogs to attack the angel. Good thing they listen to Hiraku. Moments later, Lu introduces Hiraku to the angel as her husband. The angel's name is Tia, and contrary to what Hiraku knows, angels in this world are a race of warriors. Tia is after Lu because she has a bounty on her head after the vampire went on a rampage and angered a noble. Watching them bicker, Hiraku can feel they get along pretty well. To Tia's surprise, Lu has changed greatly with how she now easily admits her weaknesses. But Lu can't help it after the dogs have shown her how weak she really is. As their conversation tapers off, Lu excitedly asks if Tia Tia wants to live with them. Hiraku is perfectly fine with it, of course. Though unsure, Tia follows Lu as the vampire shows her around the place. Lu saves Zabuton for last, making the angel fall back in surprise. With the tour over, Lu takes Tia to the fields. Hiraku shows Tia how to harvest the cabbages, and by the end of the day, all three have gathered tons of crops. Later that night, Tia savors the wonderful taste of strawberries as she learns how fulfilling farming work can be. Lu takes this moment to ask Tia to stay. After all, her her body can't handle everything if she's alone. Whether that's about farming or something else is for them to know and us to find out. The next day is filled with more farming work, with Tia summoning a rock golem to help put up fences. While carrying the crops they harvested, the new puppies come to greet them. Kuro and Yuki's family have become quite large, so much so that Hiroko is finding it hard to name them all. Hiroko builds a dog area next to the orchard to make room for the growing number of dogs. Meanwhile, some of Zabuton's children are riding the wind to start a new journey, while others have chosen to stay. Tia soon asks to leave as well, but only for a short time. Moments later, Tia returns with seven high elves led by Leah, who are between 300 and 400 years old. They all used to live in a village far to the north, but their people were wiped out after they got dragged into a war between humans. Their race was scattered, and they've been wandering ever since. After hearing their sad story and with both Lu and Tia vouching for them, Hiraku gladly welcomes the high elves to his village. 
Lou introduces them to Zabaton and the dogs, and just like Tia, they all fall back in surprise. With seven new villagers joining them, they'll need to build a proper house. The high elves know more about construction than Hiraku, so he just focuses on digging holes, leveling the ground, and gathering lumber for them. After 10 days, a house fit for seven high elves plus huge storage spaces is finished. Later that day, the high elves all help out with farm work. As Hiraku and Leia gather the garlic for storage, Leia cannot help help but laugh at Hiraku's weird knowledge of elves. Living in the forest like what Hiraku has in mind would surely have killed them. To thank Hiraku for letting them stay, Leia says they plan to do mining and blacksmithing work for him. They quickly build a smithing workstation, which they use to make a walk for Hiraku. It's like there's nothing they can't do. Well, for the better part of 200 years, they couldn't settle down and reproduce. At least they now have one thing out of two achieved. Hiraku avoids mentioning the second thing for now. The next day, Leaf approaches Hiraku to ask if she can make them some bread after seeing the village has a wheat field. Thanks to the yeast she carries, they can bake tasty bread for everyone to share. While considering expanding the wheat fields, Hiraku wonders if anyone owns the land he's been developing. Lu says it belongs to the Demon King, but since Hiraku built everything without outside support, Hiraku can claim this land as his own. As night settles, Hiraku busies himself in his log cabin. Despite the mounting work they still have to do in the coming days, Hiraku can't help but look forward to what each day will bring. This farming life may be different from what Hiraku imagined, but he cherishes every moment with all his heart. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.